Got it. Okay. Um, I'm going to call this meeting to order at 7.13 p.m. This is the Hamlet of Beaver Creek Board Meeting, September 17th, 2020. And this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. Um, if we have any visitors, you will let us know, Katie. I'm sorry, uh, Bill. Yes. The meeting started at 6.13, not 7.13, as you said. Isn't it 7.13 p.m.? I'm sorry. I'm okay. Say, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Katie, if anyone logs in, being a public meeting, will you be sure to, to let me know? Sure. And just because I'm kind of bad at this, uh, paying attention, I have my participant list up. So if I'm moving along and you have a question or would like to make a comment, will you guys hit that um, raise hand feature? And then it it shows me who hit it first and then I'll go down the list. So I'll, I'll be really mindful to that so I don't bulldoze through the meeting, which I'm accustomed to doing. Okay, so let's launch with land use applications. I know for all of you board members, you're aware of all three of these as I emailed uh, the applications to you. The three that we'll be discussing next week with the community uh, is Z0371, which is a request for a new temporary home for care. And this one is located, if you were on Beaver Creek Road and you were heading for Oregon City and you just came down 10 o'clock hill and you pass by Karis Road, are you all sort of following me? Okay. And about halfway between Karis Road and the Beaver Creek grade school on the right, there was a kind of a light blue new house with a little white fence and it's set back quite a ways. That's, that, that's who it is that's requesting this. And uh, I've reviewed the app as I hope you all have and it looked in order, they had all the diagrams, they had everything marked that you would want them to be marked like same driveway, same electrical meter, same septic, all of that. Um, it is a new one. So it's you know one of those that will in three years be keeping an eye on. Were there any concerns or comments from the board before we take it to the public? Yeah, I had one. So it was, is it an RV or a mobile home? It is a single wide manufactured home. Okay, okay. That's a 48 by that. 13, so that would be a single wide. Okay. And the person needing care is the one that will be in the, in the home. Thanks. Any other questions on that one? Oh, didn't see any hands. Good. Yay. I'm paying attention. Okay. Next one was uh, Z0358. And this is, uh, this is the requesting the marijuana concentrate pro processing, uh, and which is a, a, an additional building associated with the farm crop production. So this is the facility at the bottom of 10 o'clock hill on the west side. And back in 2016, we saw this application come through for the first building, and that was for growing. Um, there was really only one neighbor that was very concerned. And when we received the second app, I received a call again from Kelly, and we had a long conversation. And the conversation that we had talked about um, all of her concerns when this went in four years ago and the things that didn't come to fruition, that she was worried about water usage and noise and smell. And though she doesn't like to look out of her art studio up this beautiful hillside and see a warehouse, other than that, she's not been too unhappy. Um, one thing she did bring up was that it appears they have two RVs there and they're living in it which I don't believe was approved. So we talked about code enforcement checking on that because that I didn't remember that approval either. Anyway, so she was like really a second barn and what does this mean and all that kind of stuff. So she did her own research, uh, talked to neighbors, wrote a letter to the planner and the planner came back and kind of wish I had done this to start. But the decision that was given back in 2016 allows them up to four buildings, like automatic. They have to apply for them and make sure that they meet the conditions, but they're in a sense pre-approved for four buildings.
So Kelly, the neighbor, is um, feeling better about that and feels that when things are not as they should be, that she is an avenue, which is code enforcement. I haven't heard from anybody else and I've reviewed the application and the decision of four years ago and the planner's correct. So were, were there any other thoughts from you all on that? Yeah, I had another question with that. Um, was it, uh, I guess I'm, I'm unfamiliar of the rules around um, production facilities on um, uh, EF, oh, I don't remember what it was called, the, the, the farming, right? It's, it's it's the farm use, right. Yeah. What's uh, the there, are, there are rules, Jess, and that's a good question. And one of the most important is that a certain percentage has to be grown on premise mm -hmm. and not brought in so that it's more like you're processing mostly what you're growing versus shipping in and okay. processing for others. Uh, there is a percent, and I can't remember if it's 20 or 25 percent that you can in fact bring in because you might need other things in the processing yep. that you're not growing, but that's one of the biggies. Okay. I'm happy to get those. As a matter of fact, Bill, did you not share kind of those regs to us when this first came out? Yes, I sent an email that uh, quoted the ZDO on, on those particular things. And according to the ZDO, this is pretty much okay. The only thing that might not be okay is the uh, additional RVs and stuff like that, which we can certainly ask that the planning staff confirm that the existing uh, uh, approval is um, correct and that there have been no additions to that. So just sort of another little push towards making sure that they don't have anything that's illegal there. And, and we can definitely do that. If there's people living there and they're not supposed to be, then, then we can ask planning to check into that. Uh, but Bill, I'm dead certain I still have the email that you shared with us. So Jess, I'll be sure to get that back out to everybody. Let me go back. I sent it to the board. Jess, you should be able to find it for me. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll check, Bill. Sorry. Okay. Okay, no, it's great. I'm glad you're asking. Uh, okay, regs. All right. So I'll go ahead and move on to the third application, which is ZO356. And that is a, a request for a, a new home occupation permit to convert an existing guest house into a hair salon. And this was one I, I emailed a few weeks ago. Um, it's the one across Henrici Road from Beaver Lake. And it it kind of goes into a road and goes to another road that goes to another road. So it's kind of tucked up back in there. Um, I, again, I didn't see anything too weird on this app. Uh, it's, the, it's a smaller space than what they're allowed for this level. And um, I've heard from no neighbors, you know, with questions or concerns. Anyone from any of you? Okay. All right. So we'll bring these before uh, the, the public next week, next Wednesday, and um, I'll bone up on each of them just to make sure I'm a little more familiar with, you know, the locations and stuff. Okay. Far as land use activities and decisions, um, let me uh, get myself oriented here, Henry C. Road. Okay. Okay. This was Z0315 that we talked about last month at our board meeting. And it was a renewal of a temporary home for care for Dominic Neff. And the board was unanimously in favor. Um, and it was approved with conditions. Um, the, uh, so this is the one, uh, let me see. Uh -oh. Yes, this is the one, Kenny, the next one, Z0323. This is the uh, zone change request across from the golf course and 213. So if you're on 213, there's the golf course Stone Cliff, Stone Haven. I don't remember the name of the golf course. I think it's Stone Creek. Stone Creek, thanks. And so 
last month we talked about this because it came to us initially um, and we assumed uh, it was because Keras CPO was inactive and it was both a zone chain and a comp change and it was going to go to the planning commission and the board of county commissioners and then it was canceled and I think you all remember this and then weirdly I got a decision from the planner saying, well, they're recommending denial anyway. And so that's when I should have called and said, well, why are you recommending a denial when this was polled? But it really wasn't polled. It went on to a um, hearings officer. And the hearings officer, so I've done the research and listened to the tape on that. And the hearings officer did support the planning department, which was Melissa the uh, that it didn't meet all four of the criteria one of them was that surrounding homes were of similar zoning which was rrff5 and surrounding homes were not similar they were ff10 but if we had been involved we would have absolutely positively also argued the fact that services were not right there i mean yes uh clackamas river water is out on 213 but <laughs> that's a half a mile from this property so they were saying, well, you know, it says it's available. Yeah, well, if you have several hundred thousand dollars, it's available, but it wasn't right there at the property. And we certainly would have argued that point as well. But the point is it was denied by the hearings officer. The part that I can't seem to bridge is there is the big, if you'll all remember back, the Stafford Hamlet had the church that had RRFF zoned property and they wanted to do a sports facility on it. And the county approved it. It went to Luba. It came back with no, you've made errors, redo this. And then the county approved it again. And it went back to Luba. And I think Kenny, this is the one you're talking about that you looked into. Here's Jack. Yay. Sorry. Um, oh, are you there, Kenny? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Is this the one you looked into at the Stafford Hamlet? No, I was looking into the the decision for the R for it. This is the zone change I was looking into, but I didn't look into the Stafford Stafford Hamlet stuff. Okay. I, I couldn't even find the hearings officer's decision for this zoning change approval online. Right. I think they sent and, me an email saying I couldn't find it and I, right. I don't know what's going on. And I couldn't either. I mean, I got from Melissa, the planner, the, the tape of where it was first heard and denied, but there's a process. There's additional, a time for additional information. There's right. a time for um, their attorney to come back and rebute, is that the right word? Re refute. Yes, refute. And that's what I, I can't get there. I can't find it. And um, kind of more importantly, I can't for the life of me understand if the decision to approve this was based on a Luba decision on an RRFF5 owned by a church in Stafford that wants to do a recreational facility. I, it's so beyond me how we're bridging this and I'm not getting answers, but um, I, I need to really put the brakes on and pursue this. Now, what I've ultimately super learned is the county has like a graph and I need to send this to you. So properties that are zoned FF10, RRFF5 and RA2, Residential Acreage 2. If certain criteria are met, again, those four that they said they met, um, you can rezone. And this isn't, this isn't making sense to me whatsoever. I mean, I even said to them, if I had an FF10, and I met this criteria. Could I go RA1 and have 10 lots? And the answer was yes. <laughs> so 
think we need to really delve into this and find out how this is happening. And even when they don't meet criteria, they're being approved. It's concerning. Um, so my biggest concern was just to see what, because it's concerning that it was approved and we can't understand why and it doesn't look like it should have been. Right. Um, and now a president has theoretically, has been set how do you undo that? That that's the biggest concern, and I don't know that there's a way to right. undo it, to right. truly undo it outside of going to Luba. Right. And I mean, you're right, Kenny. Yeah, and and so, I wanted to figure out how long we had to go to Luba just so we know when that option expires. Mm -hmm. And you said, you know, the the hearings officer report will say how long you have. Mm -hmm. And I found some other stuff, some other reports for other things that indeed did say, but since I can't even find the report, I have no idea when the Luba deadline expires. And so I like, I don't even know if it's already expired, but we don't know because we can't even mm -hmm. find the stupid report, which it would make sense to me that even though it says you have so many days from the decision, mm -hmm. if that decision is never posted and really made public, how could you be counting days already? Right. And these are great questions. And I need to, now that I'm home, just take the time. I think the first place I have to start is back with the senior planner, Martha Fritzi, and the planner, Melissa, and say, okay, you know, I've, I've looked at, and, and I will, Kenny, forward you to you, the hearings officer recording that I listened to. So then the next step, I believe, is to talk with them again and say, all right, I've looked at everything you've given me, but everything you've given me, it was a denial. Where, where I want to see the additional information argument that was submitted, and then I want to see how this was approved and how the LUBA decision was interpreted that this applied. I think it's important that we understand this situation. Right. Then you're right. This is definitely setting precedence. We are not allowed to rezone unless certain criteria are met and clearly criteria was not met and yet it was approved. This is not good. And as much as I understand the county needs housing, the entire region needs more housing, it shouldn't be at the cost of deteriorating our rural centers. And, uh, there's many other, go ahead. And if we can find the hearing officer report, the final report, that should explain his logic and everything, right? I would, I would help. I don't know. I'm going to help. So I'm going to, to make that, uh, let me uh, make that a priority tomorrow. And uh, Kenny, do you want to kind of work with me on that? And then we'll report back to the board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, let's, let's do, spend some time on that tomorrow. Okay. okay. But also, are the rest of you, any other thoughts or things that we should be looking into? Okay. Tammy, okay. do you have all the contact information you need for the folks at the county? I think I do, because it's okay. really Martha Melissa, which I have, and then I think my next step actually is Jennifer Hughes, mm -hmm. but I don't know that, we'll see. Once we've gotten everything, then we may still be going to Jennifer, but we may not. We'll, we'll see. It's, it's um, so we don't know. I mean, I, I, it's hard to know because we just don't have all the facts. So we'll start. Sure. Okay, but thank you. And if I do, I'll email and let you know. Okay, I sure. mean, if I need some, okay. And then the final is on the agenda is the Beef Creek Road concept plan. And I'm so out of touch on that. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Um, Katie, do you want to talk about election? Yes, please. Okay, please. Um, so we have been working on the, pl the plan to do the election remote. And this last month was a little bit hectic because, uh, as you know, or you, di you don't know this, when we, the last time we met, Sue was on vacation. And so, and then when she got back, the wildfire started. So um, we are unfortunately didn't make as much progress as I wanted to make to get us where we wanted to be in the 
planning for our election, but it's looking like we're going to go with a um, vote by mail option that we'll do internally at the county as opposed to purchasing this uh, software. It's, uh, we're still working through all the, the, the nuances of it, um, but it looks like it's going to be the most uh, cost effective, the most inclusive and accessible and equitable option to do your election remotely. Um, it solves the problem of if people have don't have internet or you know access to technology. Um, and given the size estimate of our elections, I think it's the most cost effective way to do this. Um, so, but that requires some cooperation from each of the hamlets because some of the cost savings that we could um, have would would require us to use our bulk per mail permit, and that would require us to do all three hamlet elections at the same time. And um, and in order and in order to do that, we we the, in order to do the vote by mail option, we need to vet and um, authenticate voters in advance. So our process would likely be that we would send out a postcard the same way we normally do to advertise your election. Um, but we would ask voters in your hamlet to contact the county and register to vote. And that, that would allow us to know who to send a ballot to. Because as you know, we our mailing lists come from the tax assessor. And so we have mailing information for properties, not for individuals. And the way that the Hamlet bylaws are written, anybody who lives or owns property in the Hamlet can vote. And so we need to send ballots to people, not properties. And now, so- let me um, just, I, I don't mean to interrupt because I know this no, is okay. a big, but okay. And I know every Hamlet is different, mm -hmm. but for Beaver Creek, um, anyone that's interested in applying to be on the board, the application is supposed to be a next Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So I thought that's why we were going to have a community meeting next Wednesday to say, you know, here's a Zoom. And um, if, you know, if you have to just listen by telephone, you can certainly do that. Sure. I mean, you don't have to have a computer or internet. You can do this by phone. And we thought, we would just extend maybe the application receipt from September 23rd to maybe October 1st, mm -hmm. because then if, if we don't receive an application and we have the four incumbents running, I, I'm not I, clearly understanding why we would need to have a full vote by mail. I guess I'm kind of confused. We have to have an election. Right, right. But that could be done at the Zoom meeting in October because you would have your four, possibly just your four incumbents. So if we have a Zoom and those who are on the Zoom vote, oh, Bill, did you have a question, please? Yes, I want to say that I don't believe our bylaws would allow us to delay our um, elections. We don't have anything in our bylaws to allow an emergency change to our bylaws like this. To change our bylaws, it requires two town hall meetings. And the next meeting is going to be a town hall meeting. But I don't think we can do this like that. Traditionally, at our election meetings, the people who were present at the meeting were the ones to vote. People who were not present didn't get a chance to vote. Mm -hmm. And by putting this out as a mail-in kind of ballot thing, changes the way we're doing business. Now, I want everybody to be included, but if they can't be bothered to come to a meeting, even if it's just a telephone call, and Zoom does support telephone calls, mm -hmm. then I think that we can't do this. I think that uh, we need to go ahead and proceed with our regular election in at our October town hall meeting. And those people who are, are there at the meeting by either Zoom video into it, I, or I mean, the, the people who are going to be participating, uh, the members who are going to be participating there are not going to be able to be, be on screen anyway. It's only us going to be on screen anyway. So the, everybody there is going to have an audio capability. So we might have a rather long roll call vote, but 
um, I think that's the only way to do it. I don't think that we can do what Katie's proposing because I don't think our bylaws. So county council says that you guys need to just vote to extend your election till January. That was the recommendation from county council. But the I challenge with doing it remotely. Let us do that. I think our bylaws do not have any provision for us to do something like that. I can't speak to the legal decision that county council made, but I could ask them to review it again. Um, but that was their recommendation was that so, given the ahead, circumstances, Katie. the I challenge with Katie. taking, I'm sorry, Bill, go, go ahead. ahead. I, I just think that, that Steve Medcor did that off the cuff. I would ask Steve Medcor to read our bylaws and see if we can, in his interpretation, uh, abrogate our bylaws because that's really what you're asking us to do. And uh, I don't think we can do that. You know, to change our bylaws to allow us to do what he's suggesting would require two town hall meetings. And, you know, the first one we'd propose it and the second one we'd vote on it. But we can't do that because it's just not available. So um, the, the other challenges, Bill, with doing the election via Zoom are that um, we are, you're supposed to have a confidential ballot and I have no way of credentialing your voters via Zoom. Uh, so those are some of the challenges. That's why we moved away from that as an option early in the vetting process. And I am, I'm completely open to your feedback. That's why I really wanted to have a Hamlet leaders meeting to talk about all of this once we kind of had all of our nuts and bolts together because what the questions you're asking are all excellent questions and may you may very well be right. I just, a county council, I started by asking them what their recommendation was. So I, I'm happy to go back and ask for clarification and ask them to closely review this, the Hamlet of Beaver Creek specific bylaws to make sure I'll, I'm happy to do that tomorrow and get an answer for you. Um, but this, their recommendation was that we take a vote and extend the election because let me just go through my process and explain it to you and, and but understand I'm absolutely willing to investigate further. So okay. our process would be that we would send a postcard to your community the same way we do to to add, we, we always do, we send out to advertise your town hall. And we would ask community members to um, either, you know, to contact us, we'll have a, an online form or they can contact us by phone um, to, um, or mail in something to register to vote. Um, and then that would allow us to know who we need to send a ballot to. We would mail the ballots out and then collect and with a return envelope and they would send them back to us. You're absolutely right, Bill, that that will increase how many people participate. Um, at, we would have, that would, it would, the same thing would have happened if we would have gone the electronic route too. Um, we would have, when we talked to the election buddy folks, they um, indicated that they usually get uh, a considerable higher participation rate when they move from an in-person type election. They have a lot of experience with like homeowners associations and different um, community groups like that to some sort of remote option. So we can talk about if that is concerning to you um, as far as who, what, what your concerns are with increasing participation like that. Um, I saw it as a positive because it, to me, it brought raised awareness for the Hamlet and it might, it might get people interested in participating. And the fact that we're starting to do meetings remotely, um, if we continued this type of participation um, for your meetings, you might see a greater impact in your community as far as participation. So I was hoping that was a positive, but I am absolutely open to your feedback about what your concerns are. Um, and then we would count the ballots the same way that we would normally, it would take, obviously wouldn't get the instant result that we do at a town hall, um, but that was how we intended to, the, the nuts and bolts of what the process would be. To do that, we would need, it would take time. And so our thought process was to have all of the ballots due in January, to have a January election for all three hamlets. That's the time frame that Stafford normally has their election. Um, 
Malino is willing to extend theirs. They've already talked about that. Um, that is beneficial to them because they, as you know, are struggling a little bit. They do have some new applicants. So that's really good news. Um, but we would do the postcards at the same time for all three hamlets, send them out to each of them. Um, and we would allow probably about a month for people to register and then that would allow uh, us to then get the ballots out and allow a couple weeks for voting. Um, but again, I am, I'm absolutely open to your feedback and, and what you think might work. I just don't know how we would get around the confidentiality and the um, credentialing of voters at a Zoom meeting. That was, those were two big hurdles that we were struggling to solve. I can appreciate that, that struggle there. I think there's a couple of things that are on my mind right now. First is that hamlets and villages are our community groups. Mm -hmm. We organized ourselves and got the blessing of the BCC. We are agents of the county, but we organized ourselves. And to come under the county's um, process of moving all of the hamlet and villages to uh, a January election feels like it's not an individual community's decision. And that's a, that bothers me because we are, we, we organized ourselves. We didn't, and we, we got support from the county, but we organized ourselves to create the Hamlet. Um, and to, you know, just feed into, okay, we're gonna jump into the uh, uniform of the county doesn't really thrill me. Um, can you can you elaborate on that a little bit so I understand better what you mean? You you feel like we're taking over? Is that what you're saying? I I'm not going to say you're taking over. I'm saying that um, hamlets are created by themselves of themselves. Sure. And to change this, um, you know. I, I recognize that we're in very unusual circumstances mm -hmm. with the pandemic, with the wildfires, with everything else. I understand this is not normal. And, you know, we're, we haven't done that. As I said, I don't think our bylaws would allow us to do this. We would have to be violating our bylaws to adopt what the county is proposing. And uh, I, I really believe that. Um, I haven't read them in detail again recently, but I'd like uh, Steve Madcore to read sure. them and get his legal opinion. In my experience, and this is speaking only for myself, Stephen frequently shoots from the hip. And what he may have said, it sounds perfectly reasonable, but uh, I don't think it will work with our bylaws. And I would rather make sure that we are following our bylaws as an independent community organization than knuckling under to the county <laughs> to simply do what the county wants because it's either more expedient or more cost effective. Um, so th those are my, my concerns there. Uh, as for the secret ballot, I don't know, we, we didn't, I think in the first couple of times we did that, we just did it by a show of hands and we, we did we did <laughs> i was going to say that thing in in our bylaws or in the uh 210 that requires us to have a secret ballot so again that's another question for steve okay. is where is the requirement for a secret ballot um you know we we won't accept nominations from the floor uh so we can't have people just say i'll be glad to run for the board position so you know vote for me um we have we have the process where people have to apply they have to actually be sort of vetted by the county um so we have that process and so i'm not sure that there's really anything that says you must have a secret ballot so those are a couple of questions for sure. uh, him to look at and really consider um, but again, I don't think our bylaws would permit it, uh, and I don't think we could 
do it. And because we have the timeline we're on now, this, since this is September and our meeting is, our town hall meeting for elections is next month, I don't know how we can get around this. I will, I will ask Stephen to clarify those questions and I'll get responses to you ASAP on that. And I want you to um, ask Stephen about something else, but before I talk, I see I've got Jack Hip's hand up sure. and then Jessica and then Cheryl and then Kenny. So let's, let's be sure that everybody gets a chance. Um, Jack. Yes, um, two things. Uh, one, while Bill just mentioned that a couple of elections or a couple of votings had been held by raising hands, mm -hmm. like I, I seem to remember many or several anyway of whether they were, I don't know if they were for elections, but for some different matters that um, we each got a piece of paper and we wrote down what we wanted to write down and it was folded and then it was counted. So there, there is something, whether it's in the bylaws or what, I don't know, but for a secrecy. And, you know, and I think all elections, <clears throat> uh, national on down the line, have, you know, have got a trend to to be a secret ballot. And I think that's everybody's right for not knowing or p other people not knowing how you vote. That's the one thing I want to say. And I, and I think that the secrecy is important um, and should be upheld. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, Katie mentioned the postcard being sent out in the past. I have never received a postcard from the county. Um, Interesting. I don't know why, but I've never received a postcard. Um, you know, I get emails and stuff like that, but never a postcard. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Jack. Um, go ahead, Jessica. I need the unmute button. I have two questions. The first is regarding cost. What's the cost differential? Um, for the county for the software versus mail-in ballots? Um, I don't have those dollars in front of me, but I could find out, yeah. Okay, I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, and then time, my qu second question is around time. Um, when is the deadline to request an extension? An extension for the election? For the election. Yes. Um, you know, I, I would presume we need to make that decision before the deadline really is, I mean, to me, it makes, if we're going to have an October election for you guys, we need to be advertising that. So we need to be making that decision quickly if we're going to ch choose another method. Otherwise, we need to be moving to go through the regular procedures to prepare for an October election. So the, the timeline is really being driven by, of this decision is really being driven by needing to advertise for an October election if we were going to go with something that allows you to do that. Okay, and then maybe a follow-up question to that one be, um, if we have the, 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 the register when, when people came into the Grange to come to meetings. I mean, we have people and addresses there, right? Can we not use that and mail them out now? So you, th we have to invite anybody who is a, yeah. uh, who owns, who lives in okay. or owns property to it, to vote. Um, okay. And so the addresses you have are people who've attended, which right. are probably your likely voters, <laughs> but we have to invite everybody. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Cheryl. Okay. Um, at one point in time, I requested the requested information from someone, Katie. I don't remember if it's you or who it was from. I wanted I wanted to know who were all of the residents in Beaver Creek who were eligible to vote. I was given some data that I sucked into a S Excel. Uh -huh. I had to massage it a little bit, be, uh, just minor things. And I cannot tell you how many thousands of lines there are, but 
that was not a difficult task for me as I am not an Excel expert, but I got information that came from the tax assessor's office. Yes, and that's what we use. Excel format, okay. But that Is doesn't that have, not easy? sorry, I'm go sorry. ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you. Is that not easily convertible from an Excel standpoint to put into generating address labels or whatever oh, it yeah. would be? No, no, that's not the issue, Cheryl. Oh, what that's is how the we issue, then? I don't understand. The tax assessor has mailing information for properties. But the problem if we're going to do a vote by mail is that we don't know how many voters live in each home. And so we have to, we have to send out a notification. We want to send out a postcard to the okay. properties and say, if you live here and you want to vote in your Hamlet election, we need you to register to vote. That way, I, okay. if there's five people living in a house, I can send five ballots to that house to, for each registered voter. That's gotcha. the challenge we have is we have, we, we have the tax assessor. That's what I use every time to send out the postcard. Okay. And that's the list when you come in and vote normally in a town hall. That's the, where I get that list from. That's just a cleaned up Excel spreadsheet that I get from the tax assessor. Okay. I did the same thing you did. Um, so yeah, that's not, the, the issue isn't that we have mailing information. We just have it for properties, not people. Right. Okay, Kenny. All right. Um, so first, I think Bill's right. I don't think our bylaws will allow a change on such short notice. Um, I've got two questions about process. Would it be, and it might be awkward, but is it possible to do an in-person meeting somewhere like at the corner park? And then we could do a vote in person and be spread out outside? So we are technically not supposed to have large gatherings and without knowing how many people are going to come, that's really challenging. And there is also a lot of issues and participation barriers for people who might be at risk. And so ha having something like an election and requiring people to come somewhere when there's medical recommendations that they not is not an equitable decision. Um, so that's why we, we looked into a lot of things. Like I thought like, oh, could we do like some sort of drive-through thing where people drove? Through? Yeah, I mean, I've, I was getting real creative there for a while with trying to come up with ideas. Um, and we were, really, we were really told that we really should try to do something that is absolutely remote to try to be as equitable as possible. And also not knowing what the governor's um, restrictions would be, you know, we don't know from week to week what the decision's going to be. And so planning for that is really hard. And that's why we thought going with a completely remote model um, was the best choice. Um, because again, we, we literally have no idea what things are going to look like from week to week as far as um, COVID-19 recommendations. Okay. And then uh, so Jessica asked about the actual cost difference for mm -hmm. the software, but I know the county does for various things. They do surveys. Mm -hmm. So could the voting not be done essentially via like a survey on the website that's just done in house? So we looked into that too. And again, the challenge is verifying voters. Uh, we would still, we could, we could go through this whole process of the same postcard and ask people to log in and vote electronically. Mm -hmm. um, that's an option, but that then also, we know there were questions and concerns about people who may not have access to um, online services. And so we, that's why we thought the choosing the mail-in option was the most equitable, but we certainly could do a survey, but we still would need to figure out how to validate your voters. We have to be able to verify within at least some level of certainty, you know, that these are residents in the hamlet. No, nope. and I understand that. How how are you planning to do that with the mail-in voting? So what we thought we what our process was that we had county council review was that we would ask people to provide contact information when they register. And so that they would need to verify where they live and certify 
for themselves that that is their address and that they are in fact uh, eligible to vote and over the age of 18 and eligible to vote in the hamlet. And that way, if we ever were to have someone question the validity of the election, we could go back and contact those voters. Okay, I guess I see no difference between doing that via a mail-in and having the same requirement for a survey. We could I still mean. do the survey. We just, it, it's just that we still would need to ask people to register in advance. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. No, I. Uh, Maybe I I'm not maybe, understanding your question. <laughs> I guess if if you're saying to to register, you have to tell us contact information where you mm -hmm. live. You have to tell us you're telling the truth. I don't see why that couldn't be the first part of the survey. Oh, I see what you're saying, like a one step thing. Yeah. Where we would send the postcard out and ask people to provide that information in their survey. Yes, like right because the survey. You know, question one, what's your name? Question two, what's your address? All those things you would have asked them to send right. you to register to vote could just be there. And then if something's not right, the, the ballot's in, uh, that invalidated and you don't count it. And I guess I, I, don't, I don't see why, if you're not making them show up in person with an ID, mm -hmm. then I see no difference between doing it for mail-in and doing it for the survey. If it's just them telling you, I'm telling you this and it's true. Then. So I don't want to hijack your meeting, Tammy, but can I ask a question back to the board um, that we could look into an option like that, Kenny, but that would not allow for a plan B for residents who do not have, who cannot log into the survey. Yes, I, I understand that. I, okay. I, I don't, I think there's no perfect answer. So I'm sure. just trying to Ab figure it out. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Um, uh, okay, uh, Bill is next on the list. So um, one of the things that uh, I heard Katie say, I had to step away for a moment, but you said we could ask how many people are there at that address. I don't want to suppress any voters, but I also don't want to have people stuffing the ballot. So when you say how many people over 18 are at your particular address, how do we know? And we, right, go ahead. So ask your follow-up question. Kenny's question, if you say, you know, if, if you register to vote, we need the names of everybody who's registered. We need to connect the vote to the registration. That's what we would be doing. And we also make that secure so that who, sure. who voted for what? I mean, one, one of the things in our, um, public election system that the that that Sherry Hall runs is the ballots are you know unmarked. They do have a number on them, but that's just to tally the votes to make sure that we get all the ballots back. The envelope has to be signed, which is the uh, verification that you are telling the truth and that this is your ballot. Um, and I don't see how that works into your proposed system to make sure that we are getting only uh, 18 and over people who live within the Hamlet boundary to vote. So, and, and the other thing is, if you look at the past voting and look at the numbers of the people who have voted in the past, it's really small. I know. To the entire population. And I, I would be thrilled if the entire population decided that they really wanted to get involved. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen either. So Bill, first off, what we would, we wouldn't allow, we wouldn't have one person just call in and say, we need five ballots. We would have a registration system where you would have to provide each person in the household would have to provide certain personal information, their name, their, an email account, a, you know, a, some some contact information per I'm sorry we don't have technology oh I'm just saying I'm just using that as an example I'm saying each person would have to provide their own individual they would have to register themselves we wouldn't have you know someone's mom saying there's six people in this house and send us six ballots each ballot would go to an individual person we would have to have names and addresses and and contact information for each of those individuals. So it would be very similar 
to how you register to vote now, which is you have to provide your, your contact information, you know, all of your own individual information. That's how that would work. Um, I know that, that, our, that your elections are not normally large. It makes it very easy for me to count the ballots. But <laughs> I do hope that there are more voters. And we do have to, even though we don't get voters, a large amount of voters every election, we do still have an obligation to offer that opportunity to everybody. And so I, as an outreach specialist at the county, have an obligation to choose to recommend something that offers that opportunity. And within reason, obviously, we're not going to go crazy. That's part of the reason why this election buddy tool was a little too expensive for the size and amount of people that we are talking about here. Um, and so that's why we were looking at other options. We want, we want to choose something that gets this done appropriately for you folks, that gets it done efficiently for you folks, but we also need to make sure that we choose something that is accessible to everyone and to as many people as possible in within the Hamlet boundaries. That's all we're trying to do. I am absolutely open to all of your recommendations and okay. I will investigate all of your concerns. I absolutely respect that you have autonomy as a community and that you are different than the other Hamlets. I'm not looking to force you guys to assimilate <laughs> to anything. I have so much respect for the flavor of each of your communities and that's not what we're trying to do. So I really want you to understand that I absolutely respect what you all do and I respect your communities and I enjoy coming to each of the three Hamlets because they are so different. Um, we're just trying to find the best approach here in very okay. weird times. <laughs> so it is, it is weird time. Cheryl, did you have another question? Uh, yeah, comment and question. I was thinking along the same lines as Kenny um, with regard to doing things the way we normally do. Um, the rules about uh, safe distancing, as explained to me by an attorney um, about a month ago, is that masks are required if you are six feet or less between a person. And if the mask is required, is not required if you are further apart than that. And I and going to um, having a public meeting and people there would, would not be manageable. Um, off the top of my head, I was thinking, if we hold, send out the notices about uh, elections the way you normally would do, and we conduct our business as usual at October's meeting via Zoom, letting people know in that notification that the meeting will be done via Zoom. But hold the ballots and processing until the next day, allowing people to come into a controlled environment in some place like the Grange to drop their ballot in a box to be counted. Distancing will be achieved. It, we can still continue with our, our voting process the way that we normally do. We will have delayed it possibly one day. I am willing to volunteer to sit in the Grange in front of a ballot box with my mask on and, and have people fill out a ballot and drop it in a ballot box. That makes us happy. That makes you happy. And we don't have to deal with MedCorps at all. Okay. Uh, great, great outside the box, Cheryl. Jack, did you have a question? Yeah, well, a statement, I guess. Okay. Um, I want to go on the record basically as the devil's advocate. And it's that everybody thinks that the county is the devil. devil. Uh, I think that they, in these times, they are doing the very best they can to help us accomplish what we need to accomplish. Right. And all we're doing in the last half hour that I've heard is fight everything that the county is trying to do. And these are extraordinary times and extraordinary things probably have to be taken care of or 
should be the way to be taken care of. I don't think it's unreasonable. And, oh, you know, lo and behold, uh, you know, the citizens of, of the hamlet of Beaver Creek are going to stuff ballots. Well, that sounds like something Trump or Biden would say, not, not us people here in the hamlet, okay? And uh, I don't know, I think it's, uh, I think we just have to sit there and, and you know, we're not going to get shut down as a hamlet because we did something that was against our bylaws. And, you know, and it's not going to take away from our integrity as a, as a hamlet if we sit there and let the county do the thing in January, which will give plenty of time to accomplish all that's needed to accomplish to make sure that eligible voters are there and have a chance to participate. And the, and the response might be only 13 people, you know, like what we get at a meeting. It may not be, you know, 50 or 100 or something like that. So I don't think we have anything to fear about any one of us losing our positions or anything. And all I can say is please, let's just give the county a shot. Let's bend our bylaws a touch. And I don't think we will regret it. That's all I want to say. And, and Jack, those are really great thoughts. Uh, Bill, before I call on you, I actually want to share just a couple of my thoughts because, um, I mean, it's going to be on your mad core list, Katie, but number one, uh, I agree. It's unprecedented times. I mean, we've heard this a million times. So maybe one of the simple things that hasn't been thrown out there is vote by email, even though maybe not everybody has email. The other thing was Beaver Creek is a little different in that if we don't have the applications by Wednesday, and we have four positions up for vote and all the incumbents are reapplying, uh, um, is a vote not moot? I mean, if we don't have, have you received, Katie, any applications yet? No, but that's also okay. not unique to you guys. All the other hamlets have to have their applications in okay. the of yes, too. Oh, do not know that. So if we receive none by next Wednesday, again, is it not moot? So that, that's the second thing I wanted to say. The third thing I actually I haven't say, investigated that, but that's a really good question. I pres I assumed we had to have an election, but that's an excellent well, question. I Yes, that's an I excellent mean, question. It's totally a wise situation. And in these unprecedented times, who the hell is going <laughs> to run for a board right now? We're all trying to survive. We're just lucky to have amazing incumbents that are willing to run again. Now, my third and final is if MadCore thinks that we can just do these willy-nilly votes to make things, you know, to change our bylaws, which I don't think is right, but um, I also agree that we don't want to be such sticklers. You know, I lean toward some of what Jack was saying. So, hey, you know what? Then let's vote to delay our election for a year. Let's do this next year when we're not in unprecedented times. It isn't going to make any difference in the world. So if we can do something that simple per Steve, Stephen, great, then let's delay this. Since all in I'll ask, I'll ask, and uh, I will bring it all back to you. Okay, and Bill, um, now I'm sorry, you had a question. I just wanted to throw those out because my mind's going crazy. Well, um, I appreciate that, and I will respond to you as well as Jack and say that if bylaws don't mean anything, why the hell do we have them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So our bylaws are important, they are what constitute how the hamlet works. People worked months and months to get these bylaws to the place they are. I don't know what that was. Uh, but so bylaws really are important and I don't want to just sort of throw them aside because it's expedient. That's good. I mean, I respect that as well. Okay. Oh, we Kenny has more. his hand Kenny. up. Oh, uh, Kenny. Yes. Uh, just to a quick question to Katie. Did you say you don't have any applications in or no applications other than our incumbents? No other, uh, no applications other than the incumbents. And did all the incumbents apply? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> so I, I mean, would be hounding you if you hadn't, if I hadn't gotten this yet. <laughs> so I think that's just a twofold situation. If we don't receive any applications by next Wednesday, I, I, I don't think 
any of us should spend the time, the money, the effort to go forward. I think we, the incumbents stay in place and we go forward. I will, I will ask all those questions. Okay. I have them all written down and I will ask for a county okay. council clarification. Okay. And I will ask him specifically to look at the hamlet of Beaver Creek bylaws specifically just to, I okay. just want to make sure because there you're right there are possible nuances if he thought he was just looking at one I just want to make sure you know I'm not an attorney so All right okay thank you okay um I mean this was a really important topic tonight so I knew we were going to spend a lot of time sorry on no I'm really thankful that okay. you were here and doing this Katie and we really respect and appreciate all the thought and effort and creativity that's gone into your suggestion and I, I hope that we aren't appearing to be bucking the system as much as no, we'd no, no. really like to stick with what our citizens and we want to do. But, you know, if we have to work outside the nine dots, we do. So, okay, if there, I'm not seeing any more hands raised. And if there are no more hands raised, if there are any final comments about the election, either from board or Katie, then we'll move on. I just want to say, I, you are not bucking the system. And I, don't take any of your comments or questions as any sort of negativity. They're all really good questions. And that's why having these conversations is good because some mm -hmm. of them are ones that I didn't consider or in our team didn't consider. So um, that's why having these types of leader conversations is really important because you're, each community is different. Everyone has different perspectives and it's important to mm -hmm. have those conversations. So I've, thank you. I've got a quick question for Bill. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not remembering do we have write-in options or does it is it just vote for the incumbents no. or not or the the not the incumbents but the people running no we don't have any option for write-ins or no. uh, nominations from the floor anything it has to be approved in advance because one of the things that um, uh, previous uh, commissions uh, were interested in was making sure they had an idea of who was going to be running. And uh, although they never actually didn't let anybody run for a Hamlet position, uh, they wanted to know who was running in advance. And so we don't have anybody um, from the floor or written in that can become a director. Okay. Oh, that was really well, good. I didn't know why that was the case, that that was pre me. So I'm glad you shared that. I didn't know that. In that case, I would be far more comfortable just not having the election since there would essentially, if, if we don't get any additional applications, I'd be far more comfortable saying the election's moot, the only possible outcome is the four people run and get it, than I would be to extend the election against the bylaws. That's just my thought. I concur. Okay. Yeah. I will oh, find Sheriff out. Martin, how do you feel about that, Jack? Oh, I was going to say it makes a lot of sense because the precedence is set um, not only in the county, but nationally and, and everything that uh, an unopposed candidate automatically gets it. Right. So. I will so find out. Weigh heavily on next Wednesday's meeting. Yes, I will. Th that will be a, a top priority question to County Council. Great. Okay. Awesome. All right, Katie, do you want to talk about uh, we are scheduled with Board of County Commissioners? Is it all three hamlets on October 6? Yes, I asked Drenda to confirm. Drenda is the coordinator for all of the um, BCC meetings to confirm the time and she didn't get back to me today. So I will send those time slots to you as soon as I have them. But each Hamlet will get the 30 minutes like usual. Um, I don't know if you guys did rock, paper, scissors with the other Hamlets to determine the order. I can't remember um, who went first, first year, last year. First year we went first. So they made us go last, last time. <laughs> They're so mean. But I, I mean, we don't really care what we need. Okay. I, I obviously assume it's a Zoom meeting and we just need a a day. I mean, we have a day. We just need a time mm -hmm. to zoom yeah. in and then our link, and then we'll uh, work as a board to be prepared for that. Sure. Um, and the the only other thing to consider with that is I will need your if you're going to have any like written materials, your written report, or if you have anything that you want to put up on the screen, I'll need that the week before, mm -hmm. and I'll send you that information in an email. Um, 
they just so that they can put it in the packet that goes out on the website. Yes. Um, so just yeah, anything if you have anything that you want us to share on the screen, um, or you have uh, you have the report that you want to put in the packet. Just I just need those materials. Okay. In, in we haven't obviously even discussed it yet, so we'll have to have a ad hoc board committee meeting um, to just kind of go through what do we want to do. Sure. Cool. Sure. Okay. Um, one anything? Go ahead, Bill. You can share screen. So are you saying that we can't share screen for the um, commissioners? I I don't know if you can share your screen, but the way that we normally have it in the board meeting is that we need all the materials in advance so that anything that's going to be shared during that meeting needs to be in the packet. Um, I don't, I think that if it's in the packet, then our staff will share it for you. I, but let me double check how that function works, Bill, because I'm not exactly sure. Um, I actually haven't done a policy session presentation since we went remote, so I, I'm not sure what the protocol is for that, but I will find out. Awesome. All right. Any other questions for Katie on the uh, October 6th meeting? Bill's still talking. I just wanted to say that when I tried to um, share screen, I have a pop-up that says host disabled attendee screen sharing. So oh, I have to allow that for you. Do you want to share? Are you asking me to share your screen right now? No, I'm, I'm oh. talking about it. We can enable it. Technically, it's possible. I just don't know what the protocol is for policy sessions. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Anything else on the October um, 6th meeting? I'll be back with you all. Um, we'll probably do a Zoom or something. Maybe, Jessica, you can help me with that um, to just really talk specifically about that meeting because that's not far away and it's obviously a really important meeting to all of us. So, good. All right. Hey, Jack, any news uh, from the show? <laughs> oh, what a stupid question. I'm sure there's a lot of information from the sheriff's office you'd like to share. What would you like to share with us tonight? The only thing I can share is basically what the sheriff has been putting out and they're doing their best. They're under stressful times now. Um, I know for a fact, because I've been out at my house, I'm, I'm now staying at the Hampton Inn still. Uh, just because of the smoke. Um, but I have been at my house when deputy is pulled in to verify that it was me, you know. And so uh, in the past seven, eight days, um, I think they've gone above and beyond to uh, protect us as citizens and to uh, and our property and to arrest anybody that needed to be arrested. So uh, other than individual talk with a couple of deputies, um, nothing official to pass on. Great. Thank you, Jack. And I cannot agree more. I have seen more sheriff's um, vehicles out and about as I'm returning livestock um, than I have ever seen. And they always wave and they're just awesome. So thank you, Jack. And if you notice, uh, OSP has been out there. Um, in, in in Beaver Creek. Uh, yes. West yes, West. I have. Are those are the black rigs? A, a lot. Well, the black with the that kind of a lightning bolt on the side is the yeah. state. Yeah. Yeah. So, I wondered, and then I realized that's who it was. And Oregon City Police and West Lynn Police have uh, also provided manpower uh, out to Beaver Creek. So. And Estacada and Malala, you know. I well, mean, they just wanted to come see our signs because we have really nice signs. That's true. And please, please, I guess I'll say and support the sheriff and, and everybody 100%. Uh, do not ever take anything into your own hands. Don't run anybody with a gun. They might have a bigger gun and be a better shot. <laughs> There you go. We're actually going to talk about that a little bit later on in the meeting, but thank you, Jack, for that prelude, because you're right. I mean, I have had friends. Oh, Cheryl's got a question, but just like I have friends who, um, I mean, they just seen something and called it right in, and that's what they needed to do. Cheryl. Um, I could not agree more about the, the sheriff's office. After my car got hit, 
and and I had told the officer what I had been up to happened to me through that point in time. He was here longer than he needed to be, and twice he went out seeing if he could find the vehicle that hit me. When he came back, I think I'm going to start crying. He, the first thing he did is, well, he researched where I lived. I didn't tell him. And as soon as he got out of the patrol car, he said, you're Cheryl, right? Yeah. He said, I want you to know your home in Colton is still standing. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Nice. Thank you for sharing that, Cheryl. Okay, Cheryl, now that you can't talk, would you please <laughs> talk? Um, I, I'm gonna be suspectful you don't have a treasurer's report for this evening, that's fine. I, I'd <laughs> like to have it on the agenda. Do you think I could have those numbers by like next Tuesday afternoon, maybe? Probably not. Um, I, I have no access to my computer. Hey, you know what? There can be but, so little change from last month. Why don't I just put last month's figures on there? That would be perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, Let's do that. I, I did um, on one of my last trips, I disconnected the computer and it's in my trailer, but I can't connect it to anything and, and get the numbers. Um, if there's any difference, it's only going to be in the checking account by less right. than $25. Right. That's what I figured. Let's just go with last month. Nobody's okay. going to know when it, and it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, I know we're still struggling with PGE's monthly statements, but it sounds like Ke uh, Kelly Lute is giving you a hand with that. <laughs> this is when you start drinking wine, Cheryl. <laughs> oh, you tell me. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I thought everything was good between PGE and US Bank, and I monitored that system for two weeks, several times a day, to make sure that there was no rejection. And then what I get an email telling me that the account is overdue. So I did call PGE. Um, I think we're best buds. Um, they reassured me that there will be that's not a problem. They are no longer charging um, late fees because of COVID. So um, I just need to get the bill and make out a check, come over to Tammy's, have her teach me how to drink wine and then get it paid. <laughs> oh, I don't know. But that I, I did, <laughs> I did um, um, reach out to Kelly uh, with the ACH number that PGE believes that US Bank needs to authorize that transaction. It baffles me to no end why from March to June, everything was okay and there was no issue. I don't know either. It's interesting, but, but I know Kelly Lute is working with you, right? Yeah. Beautiful, okay. And along that same thread, Kelly, um, you, you submitted to her your recommendation for improving the trust report. Is that still in the works to being critiqued to something user-friendly? Mm -hmm. She called me today. Oh, good. Oh, yay. Um, we had a very long chat and <laughs> she liked my ideas on she really liked my ideas about the changes to the trust account and some other things that I talked to her about. So um, it's just a matter of attempting to get uh, the world in a calmer state so things can be taken care of. Okay. But the ball hasn't been dropped and she's touching mm -hmm. bases with you. Oh, okay. no, 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 no. No, I mean, I love the report and I also love all the recommendations you made on it and I'm excited to see the final product. It'll be super cool. And then uh, finally, just more of a notice for you, Cheryl, is you and I need to do the quarterly financial reports and they'll be due to Katie on, um, actually, I think Kelly wanted them. I don't know who gets them, whoever. The quarterly reports are due October 15th. So let's get that on our calendar. I, I will have everything hooked up by then, yeah. Okay, beautiful. All right. 
and it's going to be really simple because there's been little to no activity. So <laughs> we'll take last quarter and add, add a couple things. Okay, beautiful. Anything else, Cheryl? Oh, geez, I can't think of anything. Okay, Joe's not here. Jessica. Unmute. <laughs> uh, nothing for me. Okay. Bill, I don't know how many community community uh, committee meetings you've been attending, but it's all yours. Thank you. Um, not a lot. R1 Act is going to be meeting uh, the first part of next month. Um, the we have been we've been meeting remotely, and it's you know not not intense at all. Uh, we're still talking about the um, uh, tolling issues on I-5 and I-205, um, and we've s seen some presentations from them, um, but nothing much. The Development Liaison Committee, as far as I know, is kaput. I haven't heard anything uh, from DTD about that committee uh, Can all. you repeat which committee, Bill? The uh, Development Liaison Committee. Oh. I don't know anything about it's a that. committee that DTD put together with primarily developers and uh, special districts and the surveyor and stuff okay. like that to make development smoother for DTD and for others so that we could, you know, when development does occur, it can occur easily and quickly rather than having to drag on and on and on and you know, go so slowly. So that was the intent of that committee, but I haven't heard anything from them for a long time. The CPO Summit uh, continues to meet, and I've been sending out information to the board about the CPO Summit. Um, uh, not too much else to say about that. The C800 Citizens Oversight Committee has not, I haven't been able to meet because the last time we met, it was on a night that I, think that I was meeting with the board of uh, BC tele Telephone, BCT Telephone. Um, but I do know that they made a presentation to the Board of County Commissioners uh, recently, and they're asking the Board of County Commissioners what we should do with the excess money that they may have at the end of the project and some, for some guidance from the BCC about that, as well as they've asked us for guidance from the 800 Oversight Committee, and we suggested that they um, purchase a mobile um, command center, uh, and we thought that was a good thing to do with uh, any excess money we had. The Community Road Fund Advisory Committee, again, because of COVID-19, has not done anything. Uh, it's continuing to, to go ahead. One of the things that was part of the Community Road Fund was Beaver, uh, Ferguson Road from the south end, south of Beaver Creek Road, and all the way from Beaver Creek Road north to my house was repaved. But that was a part of the paving project, not a part of the, the regular um, CRF uh, advisory committee for, for improvements. Um, board elections, well, we've talked about that a lot. The only other thing I'd like to add is that I've been very active in trying to keep the Hamlet website up to date with various information. I've been putting up blog posts regularly on behalf of the Hamlet for things like uh, recently, um, if you have to shelter for COVID and you don't have uh, compensation from your employer, you may be eligible for uh, compensation from a COVID uh, support fund. So I put that up. I put up something about uh, livestock and connecting people who have lost livestock to finding livestock, people who have livestock to help connect them to the people who lost the livestock. So I've been putting up anything that I thought might be important to the citizens of uh, Beaver Creek on our website that I get from any other sources that I, I touch. So just wanted to put that out there that we are keeping our website up to date and I know all of you, right? All of you go to the website on a regular basis. Right? Uh-huh. Okay, we will. Just, just, I do. I go to the website. Then. So, and that's all I have. 
Uh, and thank you, Bill, a lot. I know I send to Melissa Logan and Cheryl and you often, please, please post, please post, because I just count on you guys to do that. And I really, really, really appreciate you doing that. So I'll start looking at the website more. You so, know who looks at it all the time is Rick Cook. If yes. there's a picture change, he sends it to me. I'm like, Rick, get a life. <laughs> You're so funny. Okay. Hey, Kenny, do you have any? Oh, I know you've got maybe some tolling revenue stuff from C4 and then. I don't have anything from CRW, so we can get that one out of the way right now. Okay. Um, for C4, they, they sent a letter to uh, some Oregon transportation tolling commission people. I don't remember exactly who. Um, I think Tammy's looking it up. Yes. <laughs> uh, and the draft letter was much shorter than the one they actually sent. The draft was just like, yep, we support the recommendation to use tolling revenues in the corridor or whatever. Um, the letter that they actually sent addressed some concerns I'd been hearing about tolling for a while. Uh, it, it, it does say that they think Tolling revenue should be used essentially for construction on two, 205 tolling revenue should be used for construction on 205 and for mitigation for diversion on, on other roads, right? Because there'll be diversion as a result of the tolling, it could be used for mitigation there. They did ask for clarification as to what the corridor meant. Uh, I know that some of the urban areas have been pushing for doing alternative mode of transportation improvement, which I think would require approval from the feds to be able to spend it on anything like that. But I suspect C4 is concerned that some of the tolling revenue would be sent to bike ped improvement or something like that, and that they want to make it clear that they're not supportive of, of that type of thing. Um, and then the other thing that they mentioned in the letter was there's been talk about tolling 205 before the parts of I-5 they're looking at tolling. And C4 pretty much just said, you shouldn't do that. It'd be unfair and unjust. Just toll it the same time you toll everything else. Um, because they are look, they there were discussions about potentially tolling two hundred five much quicker than the Rose Corridor and oh. other areas. Because mm. you know Clackamas County can get hit first, I guess that way. So. <laughs> Interesting. But that that's essentially what the letter was talking about. Cool. Thank you, Kenny. I very mm -hmm. much appreciate it. Um, okay. Oh, Bill, please. Sorry, Bill. I just wanted to uh, also add that one of the concerns that um, has been voiced in all of the people that I've been talking to about tolling is um, we don't have alternative transportation on I-205. You can't get from here to uh, I-5 on the bus. There's no bus. There's no buses in Clackamas County, basically. Uh, so alternative transportation has been a real big issue on tolling because it uh, puts an unnecessary burden on people who don't have a car. Uh, it, it transfers the burden from people who want to drive on their car to uh, people who don't have a car. And uh, we don't have any bus service. So since we don't have any bus service, it doesn't benefit people who would otherwise be able to use some sort of um, bus service to get from one place to another. So it's- Bill, I, I'm confused by what do you, I mean, we have TriMet. So explain what you mean. What's the difference between TriMet not having bus service? We don't have any bus service along uh, 205. You can't take the bus from um, Oregon City to Westland 10th Street. Doesn't exist. No, you'd have to go to like the town center and then to Westland. Okay, without connecting. Right. 
Maybe oh, okay. you could do that. You can't right. get to Stafford from no. Oregon City. No. And if we're taking tolling money and we want to put it towards other things other than construction on uh, 205, that's really a problem because there's nothing else to put it to. And so, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, part of, part of what Kenny was saying is uh, diverting money from developing uh, 205 to alternative transportation might work in other er urban areas, uh, other er urban parts of the urban area, but not on 205. So we shouldn't take any kind of 205 tolling and put it any place else except on 205. So that's just a comment. Follow okay. Kenny's comment. Okay, I don't see any other hands um, up. Just, just one second. I think I may have, I wanna check something. <laughs> one second. Uh, when Bill was talking, I remembered something that I was going to mention. Okay. Oh, the other thing that they were asking for clarification for in the letter was if the if if they're looking to do congestion pricing or if they're looking to just toll to do improvements or some combination of the two they're looking to have that clarified and, and developed. Because they've talked about both and I think C4 is looking for a more definitive answer. Okay, cool, thanks Kenny. All right, um, the only item I had on my list was we, re uh, Bill and I received an email from Marty Myers. He's the chair of the Redland Viola Fishers Mill CPO. And I guess that um, possibly they've just been more challenged with the end result of this wildfire. I, I, they have had more vigilante issues, like people literally stopping people on roads um, with guns and questioning people and, um, you know, my response to Marty was, you know, I'm super sorry that that's going on. I've been, the only reason I've been here, there, and everywhere is either getting animals out or getting them back in. And um, I've seen them. I mean, here, I, the worst I've seen is, as I think I said to everybody, just a pickup with some guys. I think there was a gun on the hood. But, you know, they kind of just stink at you as you drive by. But they didn't block roads. We have lots of very creative signs. The plywood industry is very healthy in Beaver Creek, but I, I mean, I didn't, I haven't heard of any issues in Beaver Creek that have it. I mean, what I have heard again is when there has been um, a, a concern about looting or arson that the sheriff's offices call and they came right out. And I even had a little issue across the street that was neither and man, they were here in like 10 minutes. So great sheriff but i don't know of any problems bill have you heard of anything i haven't heard of anything at all now okay i know yeah. that uh so what marty and and that area is doing is they're having i believe the sheriff's office katie is that it chat with them about right what you want to encourage your citizens to do but more importantly what not to do which is to, Stopping yeah, done. <laughs> Martin sent me the same email. And oh. um, so I have been in contact with the sheriff's office to try to help coordinate that dialogue. Um, and I haven't heard back from the sheriff's office as far as their availability to attend a meeting. Okay. But they have, the sheriff has on multiple occasions in our press briefing said they really are, they please stand down as far as vigilante, you know, we understand that most people have very good intentions, but the possibility of these, you know, these activities turning dangerous or um, violent are are high. You know, especially in the climate that we're in, with so many things in the news, we just really don't need more people patrolling with weapons. Um, right. And so, we we do know that some people have been arrested for theft during this time, and that is awful. Um, we, you know, I've, I feel for the folks that have been victim to theft, but we really, that the sheriff's office has been, and the 
the county commissioners have echoed that we really want people to stay evacuated and let the sheriff's deputies take care of that and partnering agencies they've we've had partnering agencies from all over the area willing to come help with law enforcement here and so response times have been great i think in one of the briefings um i forget which sheriff's deputy was saying it but normally the night shift is like six deputies and in the enhanced law enforcement areas and they've had over 20 right now and so they really have stepped up patrols they really are trying to um, make sure that everyone's properties remain safe during this time and they're asking um, residents to just stay evacuated stay safe with your families and let the deputies and the law enforcement handle um, patrolling the streets right and I mean, if you see something, say something. That's Absolutely. That's the rule of thumb. And that's what, from what I can tell, what Beaver Creek's doing. So uh, they did well one other thing, Tammy, um, they did say absolutely call 911 for reporting any sort of crime. But they also wanted folks to know that there's not as much crime going on as the rumor mill is leading you to believe um, that they, they've, they're responding to a large number of calls for you know, folks suspicious, I think they call it suspicious people um, or possible trespassing or theft. And the uh, call to arrest ratio is um, off. You know, the, the majority of the calls are turn out to be something else. Um, yeah. But it's still okay to call, absolutely. Yeah. Err on the side of your safety. Right, definitely. I'll go ahead and respond to Marty um, to, uh, tomorrow and just let him know that you know, we seem to be okay in Beaver Creek, but thank you for the invitation to participate and think of us the next time something's up. So sure. cool. I really appreciate that email. I thought it was terrific. Okay. I think so. part of Martin's concern too, Tammy, was that there was a group of neighbors that had gotten together and to promote this sort of vigilante. Yeah. We have and, one of those too. <laughs> okay. And so he was really concerned, he was concerned that they were spreading the misinformation and he, oh, okay. you know, Martin, he, he yeah. wants to help. And so his yeah. thought yeah. was, well, then let's have a meeting where we get the truth shared. Right. Yes. And we, we do have quite a group of gentlemen, quite frankly, I don't think there's any ladies involved that I've heard and they meet at our local little mercantile and they are just patrolling. And they're on five hour shifts and they drive around and when they see something, they say something and that's all they're doing. And I've got a few friends that are a part of it and they said they are not causing problems. They're just helping their neighbors. And quite frankly, they put a couple spot fires out. So way cool. So that was great, but okay. I'll let Martin know, but then whatever you guys do. Sure. All right. I emailed um, the draft Hamlet community meeting agenda for next week. So this is going to be our first community meeting. <laughs> Don't know how this is going to go, but I know from planning commission hearings that the key to the success is going to be Katie, um, our coordinator. I mean, Darcy is my coordinator on the planning commission, and she just manages all those uh, people that listen and then want to talk and, and have it. So, Katie's going to, you know, really be a make or break on this because uh, I've had awesome planning commission meetings and really struggling ones because that coordination on the Zoom is um, vital to making it flow. Anyway, the, the agenda is kind of normal other than it says via Zoom. We're going to do, we're going to do a, just call to order and introductions. I don't think I need to instruct everyone where their restroom is. And then we have a guest speaker, actually, and that's going to be Ellen Rogelin, wants to talk about community relations. Oh, she is the community relations specialist with Plaquemines County, and she asked for 15 to 20 minutes on transit development plan update. So I thought that would be a nice guest speaker, not too long, but something of interest to all of us. Then we'll have a public comment and question, and Katie, that's where you're going to be. <laughs> yeah seeing people that want to talk about something off the agenda. We might hear some stuff about COVID, fires, or whatever. Then we'll go through land use applications, really similar to how we do them now, other than when we get motions and seconds, which I kind of expect to see that from our board. And then we'll be um, looking toward Katie to help with votes. So this, 
this Katie, have you done these? Yes, but you guys vote a little bit differently than other of uh, okay. the other Hamlet. So let's talk offline, Tammy, about our process and come up okay. with something that so we both, I just okay. want to make sure that we're on the same page. Okay. Um, well, so we'll chat a little we'll bit about be that. Talking through the app. And I, I'm just going to be kind of looking toward the board because they often will support me in that to make a motion in a second. And then we'll do I'll get further. that. Yeah, that yeah. is and totally fine. I'm con are you taking a vote of the attendees? That's the part that I want to make sure. And okay. then we'll just say we're going to ask you to vote if you live, own a business or property within and we're going to trust the fact that they're Okay. voting legitimately and and it's okay so i don't have to verify them on a no. list or anything okay no, that was the part important. where i was worried okay All right but let's say you've got i got six, that okay got six people out there and you're going to get a yay and you and they are a an uh, abstain and and you're we're just gonna i don't want to drag this meeting out but we want to just work through it efficiently sure and there's three of them so it's a lot <laughs> that's okay we'll okay. get it done okay Land use activities, that's just reporting, shouldn't be a biggie. Um, I'll ask Cheryl if she wants to add anything to the financial report, she'll say probably no. Bill will wanna talk about transportation for a bit. Um, old business, I really, I don't know how much we wanna fill that. Anything you can all think of? I mean, this is our first community meeting since what, March? I don't know if we want to talk about COVID, if we want to talk about the hamlet, um, the pantry at the 10 o'clock hill. Um, there's there's lots of little things. I, I kind of like the idea of the food pantry at 10 o'clock. They are mega geared up to help. I think you ought to talk about sort of an overview of everything we've done from, first off, helping out the school kids. I mean, that was really important right up front early on. Okay. And that sort of set the stage for us doing stuff. And that leads into the 10 o'clock church pantry because they're still doing it and they're still helping. Yes. People. So I think, I think we ought to just give people an overview and, you know, everybody knows that this is a weird times and, you know, that's not going to be a surprise to anybody, but to just sort of get a high gloss overview of what's been going on, I think is a great idea. And not just at the 10 o'clock, church pantry is available for home supplies and food, but that people are contributing money and items uh, on a consistent basis. As a matter of fact, I've had two recently, we've got stuff, where do we go? And that's actually, one was Ken Hubberson. So uh, the other thing, wildfires. I mean, there's a lot of people that are still out and about, and I can give some information on how to help get some of that livestock back. So uh, and, yes, good. I'll do, go ahead, Bill. To the, the website because we have information about you know the our department of agriculture uh their database for connecting people and animals and mm -hmm. getting uh covid pay if you if, if you can't go to work because you're you've got covid or you're isolating and you don't have any kind of employer payment there's a payment available from the state to help you so there's lots of information on our website now okay Definitely bring that up and I won't hit everything. And if you think of something, chime in. And then really new business will be, um, you know, are there any applications? And so I really want to ask the board right now, are we going to accept applications for board elections after Wednesday night? Because we don't have to. We don't have to wait till October 1st. And depending on what Katie learns from Stephen, uh, maybe we just don't, you know, we'll just say, if anyone's interested in running for the board, they need to submit their application by this evening at midnight. We can say that. I think the bylaws specify that, right? So I don't it think does. we can change it. Does. It. it does. So I, don't, yeah. I don't think we can accept them after that. Okay, then that's what I will say. And then I'll just, you know, share the positions that are expiring. And I'm also going to say that everyone is opting to uh, reapply. Okay, and then board remotely meeting. Uh, oh, we'll just let everybody know that we'll be remotely meeting with the Board of County Commissioners on October 6th. Uh, other business, there's been activity on the Planning Commission. And then what am I missing? Any old, new, other that we want to add? Reader board. 
Okay, so uh, what I have on the agenda, I don't know what you can get in there, but I had put election applications and transit. You see at the very bottom of our board agenda. Yeah. I, you can just, I think those are kind of the two most important things we're gonna be talking about. And then the next town hall community Zoom meeting, October 28th, 2020, 7 p.m. elections. Now, the question is, 23rd. We aren't going to know, Katie, if if a postcard is going to go out between now and then. Well, we okay. We don't know until you talk to Stephen. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry. Normally, I'm really good about it. Uh, we I will expedite getting that information back to you, and that and then we can craft the message then. And fig, and if we do need to get a postcard out, we will get our buns moving well we just take next last year's and yeah I, the out. design yeah. is super easy Good. it really will just be the logistics of getting it to the mailing house if we need to okay 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 well and let's just see what happens i think it's uh crazy sure. crazy times but all right uh before we adjourn ooh, it's been a long meeting sorry everybody any further thoughts, questions? Uh, we got to all talk, Jack, at the very beginning of how we uh, <laughs> have been dealing in the last week or two. How are you? We'd like to hear. I'm doing okay. Uh, I'm staying at the, I'm still at the Hampton Inn just because I don't have air conditioning, so I don't have the kind of filters that might help in the house, and the house is just smoky. And um, my homeowners is covering all of it. So, uh, you know, that's a burden that I don't have. So uh, I'm looking at hopefully the rain scouring everything out this weekend. Right. Uh, uh, and probably returning home Monday. That would be awesome. Good, glad to hear you're okay. Uh, Jessica, I just wanted to mention, I looked at all my emails. I didn't keep Bill's email that he shared with the board about all the um, marijuana regulations. So if you could kind of maybe scout your emails, it would be one from Bill, I'm gonna say probably mid-August. And it was just him saying, here are the various um, ZDOs or ordinances regarding that. So I just, I know I don't have it, I just checked. Yep. Okay. Look, and if I don't, I'll reach out to Bill. Beautiful. Okay. So and I, so on my to-do list, I've got Kenny, you and I are going to be chatting tomorrow and sh I'm going to share some initial information to you. Then we're going to chat tomorrow about uh, the zone change and um, we're going to organize, hopefully Jessica will help me with this one, a quick Zoom to chat and make sure that we're prepared for the October 6th BCC meeting. And then Cheryl, um, you and I in the next month, will put together, I'm gonna wait for you to send me the October 15th financials to get to Katie, okay? And then uh, I'll respond to Marty and let him know that we're good, but thank you for inviting us. Anything else I've forgotten? Wow, oh, Bill, yes. <laughs> You're such a good hand raiser. I just want to ask Katie to be sure and get me the public link to our meeting next week as soon as you can so that I can get that posted so that, you know, we, we try to do, uh, you know, public meetings. We try to follow the laws as close as we can. You do an excellent job. Well, we didn't today because I didn't know what the public link for this meeting was. But I'd like to get it out, particularly for the larger meeting uh, for everybody uh, next week. So as soon sure. as you give me that link, that would be good. And since you know we're going to be doing this next month and the public meeting next month and the next meeting after that for our regular board meeting the month after that, go ahead and send them all up. Is that not confusing for you? No, oh, no. It has a date right on it. Okay. I just want to make sure that that's not confusing yep. for you. Okay. Absolutely. If you can do at the very least um, tomorrow's or next week's community and both of the October's, that's going to be super important because we'll be doing 
the links on more than just the website. So oh. the sooner we can get those, the better just to get it out there. So, okay, Katie, you're going to chat with, but now you're not in the, oh, well, you're not in the office anyway. Is, are you going to be able to chat with Stephen on tomorrow or do we need to wait till Monday? So I work tomorrow. I don't, okay. I don't know what Steven's got going on, but he's usually pretty reachable. So I okay. will, um, I'm on the clock and okay. he's usually on the clock all the time. So okay. I will, poor guy, he, <laughs> he works okay. a lot, but I, I'm in the office. I'm okay. in the well, office you just tomorrow. email the whole board then so that we're all just on the same page with all these various things coming up. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, anything else? Okay. I'm going to adjourn this meeting at 8.58 p.m. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. And you can stop recording and yay, 